Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to have two very special guests in Mark Hughes and Mark Bowen. Welcome to the show guys, how are you? Good, Hi, how are you? Brilliant. It was an absolute pleasure to get some uh, messages, good uh, luck messages from you back in December when we were doing our charity uh, fundraiser, so thanks very much for that. But it's a great time to talk to the pair of you. It's two incredible careers in the world of football. I've been looking at the fact that you're both the same age, you both come from Wales, I know it's a big place, but you're both from the same area. Did you ever come into contact with each other through youth and schoolboy football before you, you made the grade? Yeah, well, we're actually not from the same area. We're we're North and South Wales, so Mark's from the South. You'll you'll recognise that from the the tilt in his in his voice. Whereas I'm I'm from up north, and uh, we first met in schoolboy football, played uh, under 15s together. So that's that's where the connection started. Oh, that's excellent. Because I know, looking through your careers, obviously internationally and, and in management, your, your paths have crossed and you have worked together. Hence the reason we're all having a chat today. So, I mean, two young guys coming through school football, coming through youth football to today and everything that you have achieved, it must be tremendous to still have that connection, or like you know, a lifelong friendship. I mean, how is that when you're working together? Can it? Who who takes the lead? What kind of role do you have, Mark Bowen? What kind of role do you have, Mark Hughes? Well, if I, if I can say very much, Mark. Mark was was the lead. Obviously, he's, he's the manager. But uh, <clears throat> the, the, I'll tell you one funny story. If you like, if you like, Paul John. But uh, you know, we we'd, we'd been doing our coaching badges together, and uh, both obviously the same age, more or less, give a month month or so. And um, I think Mark was at Blackburn Rovers at the time, and, and I was just, I think I'd just finished before it. I did a short stint at Wigan Athletic. And uh, so, Mark, long story short, Mark got the, we'd been doing the coaching badges together, and um, Mark got uh, the, the Welsh national team job. And um, in the way that I do, I rang him up and basically said, Well, when do we start? <laughs> It was like automatic that I was going to be going with Mark, and he, he sort of, you know, put in his way, well, just hold on a minute, Mark, you know, the, <clears throat> we'll have to have a look at things. So, very kindly, if you like, at the time, he, he, he brought me into the Welsh setup with the under 21s with a with a, a, a solid old coach called Jimmy Shoulder, who was very experienced at the time, and just said, Look, come on board with Jimmy doing the under 21s, and I'll have a look at things. So, and I think he just wanted, you know, yes, we were friends, but he wanted to see sort of my personality around players, how I worked and whatever. And what I was lucky at the time, it used to be a situation where the Welsh a senior team and the under-21s were in different hotels and trained at different times. But around that time, we sort of travelled together and we are in, in the same sort of uh, environment. So luckily for me, if you like, I think two or three games, later, he'd seen the way I was working with the, the young lads and, and invited me then to go on board with him and Eddie Nisveski with the senior side. Mm -hmm. And that was for me, I, I look back, that was the start, if you like, of my my coaching career from then on in. And, you know, we, we had a good relationship going on from there. You know, when you, you think about your introduction to management, Mark Hughes, and it's at international level, well known as a, a Welsh goal scoring legend. How difficult is it to instill a kind of culture when you're not working with the players week in, week out, as you would be doing and as you later did at club level? Do you think that's a big challenge for an international manager? Yeah, it can be problematic. Ideally, you want time, more time after games, if I'm honest, because you want to review, you want to go through everything that's gone well, uh, what hasn't gone so well. You want to be able to work on that, which clearly you can do at a club uh, situation but uh, so that was a, a frustration because you, you you knew there were elements that needed to be worked on and um, you didn't have that opportunity but um, for me personally as as a young young coach a young manager going into my first job uh, I was still playing so um, that was difficult but I made a conscious decision that I wasn't going to continue my international career as soon as I got the job I decided to to stop playing and uh, I separated both both roles so when I was back at my my clubs uh, I was still still very much a, a player uh, but as soon as I came into the international um, fold then I, I quickly switched to, to being a manager and I have to say as as a young coach it was the best best thing I could have ever hoped for because it exposed me to to the, the 
every element that uh, football management uh, throws at you, um, probably more so because it was so condensed in, in a short space of time. But after the game, when everybody went back to the clubs, it gave me that breathing space to understand what had gone on and, and how well I'd done as an individual and how well we'd done as a group. Um, and that breathing space allowed me to be better next time because mm-hmm. I'd give myself a quick slap and say, goodness me, you've got to be better than you were last time. So uh, you'd like to think that the next game you'll be better and better again. So I had four years of that. So come the time when I made the decision to go into club football, I, I felt very much ready for for the nip and tuck of pr- Premier League football. And I, mm-hmm. I think that's that's why sometimes uh, players with a good playing record and a good career get opportunities and that's that's what happened to me. I got the opportunity of Welsh national manager because I'd had a good career. Um, but you've still got to be able to to do the job and uh, sometimes going into management, uh, well, hold my hands up, I didn't really know what I was doing from one game to the next initially. But uh, uh, thankfully that, that period of time allowed me to, to understand what, what I wanted from my teams. Uh, whereas I, I think you see other big name, so-called big name players going straight into management and sometimes they fall flat on their face. So I'm forever grateful for that first opportunity from a Welsh FA. Mm, definitely. Another big thing, and I think it does happen in other jobs, but when you're looking at football in your earlier coaching stroke managerial career, you're managing players who you've perhaps played alongside and they've been your mates and, and obviously you've uh, travelled with them, etc. How difficult do you find that? Mark Bowen, first of all, how, how hard is it to differentiate between I'm now the gaffer rather than I'm part of this this team? I think it's, it's uh, y- you are there to be shot at, you know, and I think it's, it's earning the trust, you know, and uh, <clears throat> we've always said that uh, top professionals and top players, they, they want they want direction, they want structure, they want discipline in their lives, they, they want to see what's happening in the day-to-day work that they're doing. So you feel, if you, I know I did, and, and you feel very much aware that you've got to make that impression on them early. You know, you, you don't get too long, if you like, that if they draw conclusions about the way you work and about your personality early on, it's hard to turn that round. So I think once you get through that, and the same applies, I suppose, when you first go into even... All right, that was at the start of the, the, the coaching career. But even when you go into every every new job that you go into, yeah, there, there's no doubt about it. You feel, I think you'd be lying if you said you didn't feel a little bit of pressure to be, make an instant impact on people to show them that, if you like, you know what you're doing and, and you, 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 you've you got their best interests at heart and you can improve players as well. I think um, a story that John Hartson once told me about being the player under uh, Mark Hughes at Wales is that, you know, there was always this uh, willingness from the team to to do the best they could for the gaffer, and I know there are so many there are so many occasions in the past where we see that that isn't the case. We hear all the cliches about players downing tools, etc. But you um, narrowly missed out on qualifying for the Euro Championships in two thousand and four, Mark. When you look back on that, and obviously the success that Wales have had since then as well, do you think you'd ever get back into international management? Yeah, it's not something that, that I, I dismiss because I've done it so early in my career. I actually did it, well, everybody said I did it the wrong way around. You're supposed to do international management towards the, the, the fag end of your career, but uh, um, I did it at the beginning maybe, so uh, so it was a little bit different. But uh, I have to say, when I when I got the Welsh job, um, Welsh football was in a little bit of a, uh, a situation, a bit of turmoil, if, if we're honest. We weren't playing particularly well and... and the support and the way we travelled, the way we went about our business wasn't where it needed to be. And, and myself, having been at top clubs, um, I used to get frustrated going to, to Welsh squad. I used to enjoy it because I used to love meeting up, playing from the country. But I just, the stuff around the edges and uh, the quality of kit, travel, facilities, pitches, all that was wrong and wasn't at the level it should have been for international football. So a big part of my job was just to make us understand the level that we needed to be at. And um, I think the players appreciate that and saw that early on. I was trying to do the best for them. And and in fairness to, to the guys, you're right uh, in saying that they were my teammates and uh, it could have been more difficult for them than it actually was for me telling them as ex-teammates. But... Um, 
I think they were so keen for me to be a success in the role because we had a number of years of mediocrity, if we're we're honest. So uh, I had that that support from them right from the off, and uh, that was invaluable. And uh, and I'd like to think in the time I was there, we we just pushed things on and made maybe the Welsh FA understand the stances that they should be adhering to. And I think that's possibly carried on when uh, Wales has gone on to to great success. I think those. Uh, initial few years, certainly in my reign, I think probably helped the the mindset of the FAW. Oh, so well, definitely. Think, what do you think, Mark Bourne? Yeah, I, I I just think as well it was the the, the, so the infrastructure behind things. To add what Mark was saying, then you know very quickly, Mark sort of you know made made, made uh, decisions to change the hotel where we stayed to get the training ground better. You know, we moved actually, which people really questioned, including the Welsh FA themselves, that questioned the fact that Mark wanted to play. Than at the new national stadium, you know, mm-hmm. and you know, Wales were having crowds, I think, around about was it 10, 10,000 for games and whatever. And if we're, we're lucky, <laughs> yeah, if we're lucky. And I think Mark's last game, I think there was 75,000, you know, when we played Azerbaijan at home, which would have been com- a completely unthink of. And, you know, we actually I'm very proud of the fact, if you like, a lot of people were shouting me down this in Wales, but we'd actually turned it around where football became the number one sort of spectator sport, really. Instead of the, the, the rugby situation, which I'd probably get hammered for saying that, but it, it was That's not bad coming from a South Wales boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it, no, but I think in fairness, I can add to that, that Paul John, that we, you know, everybody, every man who goes into a club it has a situation where you invariably go into a club because things aren't right, you know, for whatever <laughs> reason, you know, and I think it goes under the radar. If I might say this about Mark's situation, that <clears throat> all the clubs we've been at, you go in. And it's having to address situations and, and to, you know, the culture, the identity behind the scenes to get that right, which I think he's, he's, he's had his, his thumb on right over the last 17, 17, 20 years, whatever we've been working. I think it's really interesting to look at the foundations being, you know, put in place by yourselves and then the, the success that then came for Wales. I remember sitting on the couch in Scotland watching Wales and willing them to do well, obviously under Chris Coleman years later and the, the documentary that came out by Johnny Owen uh, to, to look at the success of Wales. So it's it really is, it's key to look at the foundations of that and how obviously, you know, you set you set them on their way. And and now you're looking at Wales um, and you're looking at you know, some of the world-class players that are playing for them. As a Scottish fan, having not had that experience for about 22, 23 years now, he being in the finals, um, looking at Wales and supporting them as a Scotsman, it was tremendous. So, yeah, absolutely. You should definitely take, take credit for the foundations that were laid. Now, going further a wee bit back about um, your club game as, as players, I remember sitting... Uh, Mark, who's watching the 1991 European Cup Winners Cup final? Um, it was live on the TV in Scotland that night. Uh, great, superb, because I've always had, um, you know, I've always had an affinity with Barcelona as well. You look at them uh, down the years, the players they've had. And I remember the big kind of chat around that game is the fact that you spent a couple of years uh, at Barcelona. Um, you scored the two goals that night. But again, Mark Bowen, you've had success as a player in Europe and you look at the Norwich side, particularly, I know you were also part of the Spurs side in the early 80s. How important is it from a managerial perspective, that European success? Because back then, even as a Scotsman watching the Norwich run, for example, the, the Bayern Munich games, um, Mark, you know, the, the um, introduction of Chris Sutton into the, the Norwich team, you're aware of all this. I mean, it, it spreads throughout the country. And then watching Man United live, it's a massive thing, European success. How big is it for you um, as managers and your ambitions as managers? Uh, well, from my point of view, I, I was always uh, a real student of, of the game and these European nights were, were always special. Certainly, uh, when I was playing for, for Man United, there was, I, I used to call it a, a crackle in the crowd when you had European nights and, uh, and those were really great games under floodlights. It always seemed to be a little bit quicker the pitch, a little bit of dew on the, on the grass and uh, I used to love those games. And, uh, um, well, thankfully, we, we had a modicum of success, had a great run. We're actually, we were actually flying the flag for for English football at that time because uh, we were the first team allowed back into Europe after the ISIL disaster. So uh, certainly we, we felt after five years out of Europe, we, 
we felt we we needed to make a good fist of it and uh, try and go as far as we could in the competition. As it was, we we found ourselves up against my old team, Barcelona, and uh, uh, thankfully we came out on top. But um, a great night, uh, fond memories, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, scored a couple of goals, one maybe a little bit dubious, but it's certainly I had the last touch. Uh, Steve Bruce won't thank for me. I don't think he's ever for, forgiven me for knocking her over the line, but... As I said, I was just doing my job, so, uh, so that was my excuse. So, uh, yeah, uh, European lights were, were always very special. Really, really enjoyed them. What about yourself, Mark? A, a, a team like Norwich, I, I once said to Chris Sutton that they were an unfashionable side, and he took offence to that. Uh, but what I said to him was, you know, Norwich, would I normally be looking at Norwich up in Scotland? Probably not. But at that time, the third place finish in the league, the UEFA Cup run, it was fantastic to see an, un, an unfancied side doing well in Europe. Yeah, certainly in Europe, um, <clears throat> well, week in, week out, I think at the time, we, we, had, a, we had a really good side. Um, and it came together well, and we, we had a, a way, a certain way of playing football or trying to play football. We always felt we were trying to punch above our weight, especially in in, in Europe, you know. And, and you know, the, the run, the, the UEFA Cup run that we had was was special. And again, every, every game we went into was as the underdog, basically. And going out to Bayern Munich at the time, being the the first, I, th I still think we're the only ones, but certainly the first at the time, first uh, uh, English club to to go there and win on the, on the stadium, the Olympic Stadium, and. We actually got knocked out by Inter Milan in the quarterfinals. It was, and they went on to win it. And I still say to this day, I think the two games against Inter Milan were very closely matched things. I think Dennis Burkamp nicked a goal in both ties, really. And I mean nicked a goal because we played really well in the ties. But we came out with a lot of credit. And I think maybe I say this in hindsight. You know, if we if we had the, the maybe the mentality of, like I say, Mark being a Manchester United player, or whatever. I think it, maybe I'm wrong saying that we. Even playing you know, the, the likes of Inter Milan in the, in the quarterfinals, we probably lost the games, the two legs, because we we had a little bit of an inferiority complex. Instead of actually thinking, well, we're as good as these, we can go and beat them. You know, that's what probably cost us in that in that in that tie there. But yeah, I mean that that mindset of punching above your weight and, and going into those those European games because it is a different a different state of mind, obviously, from the week in week out games that you you play. It, it's got that little special tag to it, and like Mark said, it's got that little little edge, a little different feeling, isn't it, going into it? You know, that there's a there's talk all the time about competitions changing, European competitions changing. Um, what's been lost, do you think, when you look back to the, the old-style European Cup, obviously it became the Champions League, the Cup Winners' Cup that we no longer have, the UEFA Cup going into Europa League, do you think it's lost uh, any of the romance of European football? Do you think it's for the better that we've changed it? Um. I'm a little bit of a romantic, I think. Um, I quite like the competition. It's been uh, straight knockouts, but I understand why it's changed. Clearly, uh, the amount of money, TV money around European uh, football, notably the, the Champions League, obviously, uh, they need more games to to get uh, the, the wider uh, viewing figures up to, to justify the fees that they're paying for football these days. But um, I just think uh, it focuses the minds a little bit more so where when you knew you only had two legs and where goals and all that all factored in and um i think sometimes when i watch uh some champions league uh group games some of them are dead rubbers too mm -hmm. early and uh, you know there's only a certain uh number of clubs that will end up at, at the top of the the table but uh i think yeah it could be slim and slim down somewhat maybe but um in saying that, I mean, when you when you get the the big teams uh, going on head to head, more often than not, in once they get through the group stages, then uh, then that's when the competition really begins in earnest, and uh, and you see the quality of the the teams in Europe uh, going head to head, and that that's when the Champions League uh, starts to really form. Mm. You know, looking at the managerial uh, record as well qualifying and playing in Europe for Blackburn, Manchester City, uh, Fulham and perhaps looking ahead to your next move in the world of football. How important is it uh, that European football may also be part of any any future job that you take on? Well, uh, it's, it is it is there. I mean, we've experienced it on numerous occasions that good nights and, and poorer nights as, as everybody who's been in football any length of the time will tell you. But uh, European nights... I've always figured highly in, in my career, both playing-wise and uh, and in management. Uh, we had great runs with, with Man City, um, 
went into Europe with with Blackburn as well. Had good results against big teams, Paris Saint Germain. I think we we played Hamburg, all big European teams, and and always acquitted ourselves really well. And it, it was always a different test. It was always uh, different from your your week in week out of league football, and because they would set problems for you that you you had to solve, and then you mm. had the answer very quickly because if you if you didn't realise what was going on tactically, then uh, you could be very quickly out of the tie. And uh, I think that's where my experience as an international manager came to the fore because invariably during my time as Welsh team manager, we played all the big countries, everybody. We didn't duck anybody. We played Italy, Germany, um, almost anybody you can imagine, Argentina, Brazil, everybody came to the, the national stadium and, and we had to be right tactically and physically if we weren't then we would get a doing but for the most part we we give a good account of ourselves and i think that helped when we went up against big european teams because we had that experience of of international football when really you were, you were the underdog going into these games and you, you had to make sure you didn't go under uh, tactically because uh, these guys would set you major problems mark bowen um i'm going to ask you Mark Hughes said there about, you know, focusing the mind on the, the kind of knockout games. And you've also touched on it as well. When it comes to a mentality, when it comes to trying to tap into players uh, to get them tuned in for the big game or, or the week-to-week -week games in club football, how difficult is that? And how difficult is it at the sharp end of football? You know, the pressure that's constantly on, on managers and coaches, the media attention now, social media attention. How difficult is that for a football manager? I think it's it's all to do from my point of view with with the culture and 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 the way you you have your day to day if you like work in life within the club you know to make sure that the, the demands are always there on the players you know which is the hardest thing all all players players who go to whether it be Manchester City whether it be a Celtic whether it be whatever they're good players by the very nature they're at they've arrived at the club but it's then it's the mental side of things which. More and more, so as over the years, it's it's that's the, the the key thing to get that motivation into them, and it's not just the 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 manager, the manager and his staff putting demands on the players. It's creating that culture where the, the players themselves put demands on each other. They don't accept second best. They don't accept you know casualness in, in not just uh, say three o'clock on a Saturday, but right through the week. You can't just I suppose if you're a, a Lionel Messi, but you can't you know. Even Cristiano Ronaldo trains 100% every day. You have mm -hmm. to have the mentality within your club, the culture, the identity of your your work in life day to day. That that we are we are this team, and and we don't accept any any mediocrity around us to the best of our ability. Mark always said when we, when we first started coaching, he didn't want to, and relaying back to what he said about uh, creating the right environment, you know, with, with facilities. Even you want to get to a Saturday. You know, if you play on a Saturday, you know things change these days. But you want to get to a situation where, if you use the, the, the anachronism, but it's five o'clock on a Saturday, you've got beat. You don't want your players because we all know footballers are like. We've been them ourselves, Mark and I. That if they can find the excuse, they will. You know, so you don't want a, a situation where if you lose on a Friday on a Saturday, it's five o'clock, and the player goes in, yeah, and says, well, yeah, it was because we didn't do this right, or we didn't do that right, or this wasn't quite right on Friday or Thursday. You wanted the players in their own minds to be saying, if you came in and you you you, you said a few choice words to them at five o'clock because they hadn't performed, that they would basically just sit, sit there and accept it because they'd think, well, yeah, because you guys have given us everything we needed. The tactical awareness, the build-up to the game, everything, the information. And it didn't work on a Saturday because, yeah, look at myself, I didn't quite perform. Put my hand up. But you try to take that sort of excuse environment out of it, which creates... Obviously, that creates the results, you know, the, the sustainability results, really. You know, looking back to what you were saying about the, the Welsh setup when you when you moved into international football management, and there was a lot of things that had to change to instill that culture, Mark, and the mentality and just the way that you were going to be doing it and create an identity. Were there occasions, Mark Hughes, in your club management where you've gone into a club and you had to have that transformation as well? Yeah, if uh, if I'm honest, probably uh, every club situation we walked into was similar. Probably the only one that didn't have a great deal of work to be done in terms of facilities it was Blackburn Rovers, which uh, was a fantastic setup. Uh, the, the only thing wrong with it was that they had this, I think they spent about £10 million on their training ground when 
Uh, so Jack Walker was there and uh, and it was a fantastic facility. The, the only thing from my point of view is that the first team facility was down a hill and, and about three quarters uh, less uh, of, a, of a size. So uh, all the, the academy guys were all up at this state-of-the-art facility at the top of the hill. We were down the bottom with the with not enough space to to really grow and become what I wanted the team to to be. So uh, after my my first year at Blackburn, I made the decision, which politically was a little bit hard to get through, but uh, I made the decision that we were going to swap and we were going to go up and use the state-of-the-art facilities at the top of the hill and the, the youngsters would have to use what uh, the building that we were in. But from my point of view, I thought... It was it was a good decision on on a lot of levels because first and foremost we needed the right facilities to grow ourselves and we obviously were the the head of the football department in terms of uh, having to go out there on a Saturday and win games to to make sure the the club was sustainable. But for for the academy players and the young players, um, the fact that where they lived was actually right next door to to the academy buildings. So I always felt it was good that they had to every day walk past. The, the, the pitches that we were playing on, walk past the facilities that were there for them. They had to walk all the way down the hill and earn the right to come back up the hill and, and train on the pitches that, that we were training on. And uh, uh, from that point of view, uh, an aspirational point of view, I think it was a good good lesson for, for all the younger players at the club. I think there is always a danger you give them too much too, too soon and then they're not hungry enough. So... Mm. Um, that was part of the decision behind uh, swapping the, the facilities over. The oh, same excellent. Be, yeah, same, same can be said of Man City. I mean, people uh, would, would suspect, and I did myself, that the reason that I left Blackburn Rovers was because I wanted to go the next step. And I viewed Man City as a big stage, big club. Um, and I got a little bit of a rude awakening when I walked through the door because the, in terms of facilities and what, what they had an offer to prepare the first team, it was way below what I just left at Blackburn. So mm. uh, we had to have a big revamp of all the training facilities there as well. It helped that when the new ownership group came in uh, from Abu Dhabi, um, I think they completely revamped the, the whole uh, structure in terms of the training ground and, and the gym area. I think we went away uh, for a week, uh, pre-season training. We came back and it, it all been done. So... Uh, uh, they had the, the resources and the ability to do that. When I look at the Manchester City uh, time that you spent there, Mark, and I look at some of the players that you've you managed and, and many of the players that you brought in yourself, and the, the key one that always stands out for me is Vincent Company. when you look at what he went on to achieve uh, after you brought him to the club. Um, you know, the honours are incredible and it, it's aligned with the success that Manchester City went on to have. How difficult is it to deal with high-profile footballers, uh, possibly big egos? I mean, is that a difficult thing to deal with as well? I mean, it's hard enough dealing with two or three people that you work with. Imagine managing 20 or 30 footballers. How difficult is that? Yeah, that's the skill that you have to have. If you if you haven't got it, then uh, it's going to be difficult to have any longevity in the game as a manager because uh, um, players will test you. Um, they'll test your your ability to to get your message over, and they'll question everything that you do. Um, and you've got to have the answers for them. If you don't, then in their eyes, you, you diminish somewhat. So you you've always got to be prepared. You've always got to maybe preempt what they're likely to ask or, or demand and uh, if you're ahead of the game then you you can obviously put things in place before the questions even asked so uh, uh, we were constantly as a coaching group trying to do that and try and preempt what situations might arise if we don't do certain things in a certain way um, and I think that that helped sustain us and, and helped us to have that connection with the players that we we were in charge of. Matt Bona, I always look at uh, footballers who go into management and it may be a cliched type of question whereby people say, you know, have you used the experiences from other managers to enhance your own approach, etc. And one manager that I think you worked under that Celtic fans will be interested in is Martin O'Neill. Um, I don't think he had a, a, a joyous time at Norwich, but what was your memories of the kind of pre-Leicester Martin O'Neill as a manager? Uh, very impressed at the time and 
think to Norwich's detriment, he had a, I don't know what the, the political situation was, but he spent a short space of time there before he went on to uh, Leicester City. I think it was more to do with his relationship probably with the chairman at the time. But obviously I'm not privy to that. But I think the one thing that struck me about Martin was was his, just his, his huge uh, enthusiasm, if you like, you know, to... to I think he's been well documented. He, he he wasn't really one I would say on the on the training ground um, in terms of coaching. But the one thing that did stick in my mind was in the dressing room. You know, he'd want he'd really get into players' heads in terms of wanting them to to go onto that pitch and run through brick walls for him. You know, and um, yes, and it didn't didn't spend as long as I wanted to with him. But uh, that was that was the shiny thing that came through to me at the time. You know, I think. The one thing I think, when I what Mark was saying as well, in terms of any football club you go into, the one, we went into Manchester City, and um, they were a club at that time. I would say they were a big name, if you like. But like Mark said, there were, there were certainly things they weren't sort of living up to in terms of performances as a club. And we went in there, and there was money being spent, but at the same time, there were there were a group of players, um, I, I, the likes of Mika Richards, Stephen Island, Ned Manua young lad called Michael Johnson, who was a very, very good midfield player who had to retire through a bad knee injury. But they had a group of youngsters who, who I mean, Mark will correct me if I'm wrong here, they had something like 100 games between them, uh, sorry, mm. between them, which, because, and they, they were recognised first-team players, and it was it was dealing with them then, because they they uh, they were getting a bit disenfranchised, because they would see a lot of, like, big-name players coming in. And it was, it was almost, yes, we were getting new players in, which is, is a job in itself to get them integrated and, and into, the, into the, the mentality that you want at the club, but also to actually spend time and, and, and work with and, and acknowledge those other players who, you know, each one of them went on to play, a, 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 had good careers, very good careers and played a big part. But they, they could have easily gone under, under, the, that's under the radar, out of the way, if you like, and, and, and just basically not being recognised and end up leaving the club and doing different things. But uh, I think nearly all of them would say they actually had good careers. And so that was another side to it, not just the one about new players coming in and having to make sure they quickly sort of played their part in, in the, what was to come, the success what was to come, but looking after and nurturing those younger players, which is, I know we've always had in our minds throughout, throughout the places we've been. Mm. I was going to ask you about, you know, youth development. Uh, Mark Hughes, at a club like Celtic, we've always prided ourselves on rearing our own talent. And in recent years, after a few years, selling them on. Um, but, you know, post-COVID, post-Brexit, how key is youth development going to be to British football clubs? Because I think, you know, since maybe the, the advent of the Premier League, it's been difficult a lot of the time because there's so much onus on these transfer windows. You've got to spend big, bring in players from all over the world. Like Mark Bowen just said there, it would be easy for a lot of them to fall by the wayside. How important is that focus going to be, do you think, going forward, Mark? Yeah, I think it will change to the benefit. Um, you'd like to think so. I think, I think fans of any club like to see young talent uh, come through the ranks and uh, and put the shirt on. And I think they have a special affinity. I think with the with the home fans, if if you can get young players through, and I think that can sustain you and and. In, can actually, as a manager, buy your time because the young your team might not be functioning, but the young lads doing well. So you can uh, you can acknowledge that and uh, and benefit from that. So uh, yeah, I think um, youngsters will always have the challenge at the top level of the game. Um, certainly in the Premier League, it's it's a world game. It's not just a British British league anymore. It's uh, they 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 have the pick of. Uh, players from all over the world, as I say, Brazil or whatever. Um, I think with the Brexit and the difference in the in the regulations now, other markets may well open up that we weren't privy to or weren't didn't have access to. So uh, that may well change, uh, but that will be a challenge for, for the younger players coming through. Uh, the, the reality at the top level of the game, certainly in, in the English Premier League, is that you've got to be an exceptional player to be a Premier League player these days, and, and that doesn't—it doesn't matter if you're a young player or whatever. You've you've got to have that talent, and you look at uh, the lad Foden, um, obviously broke through into a very very good Man City team, but that just shows you the level that he's at as a young player, and uh, a lot of young players won't get opportunities, unfortunately, as well, because um, obviously their pathway to the first team will be blocked by 
very, very good players that have got more experience and, and have been in the game longer than them. So it's a challenge for, for all young players, as it's always been. Mm. One thing we're seeing at the moment, Mark, is uh, a lot of our young players, certainly from Celtic, are going elsewhere before they've made their debut for Celtic. So we've had a few guys going to buy Bayern Munich one of your, your old clubs, in the last few years. How important do you think it was to your own development, you know, um, going and sampling uh, the football in Spain and Germany? Yeah, it certainly helped me. I came back um, a better player, um, a more mature person as well. I went there as a young player. I, w I wasn't married. Uh, I didn't have that structure behind me, so it was more difficult for me. But I, I came back a married man with, with children and uh, a better player as well because uh, I had that support uh, system around me, which I didn't have when I first went out there. So, th so that's important. Um, I think it's the game is ever changing. We, you have to accept that. And I think the key for any management group and and anybody working with with the players within that club is that you have to have an understanding of where they're coming from and I think a big part now is understanding uh, your own impact on them as individuals and having an understanding of of emotional intelligence and how that uh, affects players and and how they, they deal with the messages you're trying to give them um, mm. um, you can say one thing to to one player and say exactly the same thing to another player and they'll interpret it completely different because the diversity of dressing rooms is, is really different now. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a big challenge for, for managers and coaches these days. I think it's important as well, Paul, to be, to be what I would call like well-read on things, you know, like Mark said, the game's changing and evolving all the time. And I think we've always prided ourselves in, Mark always uses the phrase, the phrase that all coaches are thieves, you know, and so you're always got to be looking at other coaches and managers and what are they doing and, I don't think there's a lot too much new out there, but there's certainly adaptations on, on things that, that coaches and managers have always done. You know, I think Mark, myself, were the first, we were in the first group of uh, English uh, coaches to ever be uh, uh, granted the pro license back in, I think it was 2004, Mark, wasn't it? Something like that? Long mm -hmm. while ago. And it, 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 because of that, and, and since then, you have got to be, I find, you know, on top of things. You can't just basically sit there and think, well, this is the way that. I do things or we do things and it's always been this way and and believe me there's a lot of I think there's a lot of coaches managers out there who are still doing the same things now as they've always done yeah you know, I think yes to a degree yeah if you've been successful doing that but you've got to be adaptable as well and then looking at how things change and how you can make your your group your team your club stronger and better you know, when you're looking at that, Mark, and, um, you know, the advent of data analysis, everybody, uh, even football fans, seem to be getting hung up on stats, but it's incredible the, the kind of level and the depth that these go to. And a lot of clubs are investing a lot of money in data analysis. How important do you think that will be going forward for management coaching teams? Well, it's been there for a long time now, I think, uh, when I was at the, the Welsh team there. Uh, Prozone was just coming to the fore and I, I think uh, I was probably one of the first to, to introduce it at an international level when they were they still using videotapes and uh, doing it by hand, so to speak. So uh, so I've always used um, the access to data. Uh, clearly, the, the skill is in um, extrapolating the key elements of a huge amount of data that's presented to you leading into a, into a game. So uh, that's the skill. You've got to be able to pick the things that are relevant to you as a team and relevant um, to the opposition that you're up against if you don't do that or you haven't got the skill to be able to understand what's important within the, the reams and reams of, of data that you're presented with, then uh, it doesn't matter what amount of data you have. If you can't pull that key information out and use it to your own benefit, then um, you're just as well just flying by the seat of your pants because uh, you, you're going to get uh, just the same um, amount of uh, benefit from it. You've got to have an understanding of how it works, how it uh, attaches itself to the game itself, and uh, you see trends. And we used to work on, and obviously, how many sprints we would do uh, against good opposition. Uh, initially, when we were at Blackburn, I seem to recall, our big thing was that we wanted to be strong at the end of games and we prided mm. ourselves on that. Uh, but when the data started coming back, when we went up against the top teams, 
we noticed that we'd still run probably a third further than them, but we'd get beat because we weren't sprinting as much as them. So it was only through looking at the trends over a period of, of four or five years that we understood that actually you've got to sprint harder and you've got to sprint for longer if you're going to overcome the top teams. So those are just elements of it that you, you pick up along the way. Mm. Yeah, I think as well, Paul, what I'll add to that is that you, you have got a situation now where the data is coming so much more into the recruitment of players. You know, and I, I look at teams, for example, like me, uh, Brentford in the Championship down in England, where, you know, they, they actually, the recruitment is based around, they look at players, how many crosses a player will get in and what, you know, in relation to their team. And that's fine. That's fine. And But I think at times that can help. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's hard to put into words, but in, in as much as a manager has always got to have that, let's say that final say, is this player? Yes, you can show me all, all the data on him. But is that player going to fit into, you know, is, is he going to be the type of player that a fan at Celtic Football Club, for example, wants to see in terms of my style of play, how I want this team to reflect the way I want them to play? So it's all right having all those sides, but at the same time, it surely has to be at the remit of the, the, the coach or manager at a certain club you're in, does he fit into what you see? And if he does, great, because, you know, managers hang their hat on him then and you live and die by results that way. But if it doesn't, well... You know, at the end of the day, the thing that gets pointed at you saying, well, yeah, you brought this player in and he's not good. But sometimes it's because it's been done by a different analytic process with the recruitment department. Yeah, certainly. Now, you mentioned Celtic there. And as I said at the top of the, the discussion, you sent us a great message around about Christmas time. And at the end of it, I had a wee laugh to myself because you said, hail, hail. And I think that appealed to a lot of Celtic fans. There's a big affinity with Celtic all around the world. And it was great back in the day when players played for 10 years or over, where we would travel all over the place to, to play in testimonial games. And one such match back in 94 was for Mark Hughes going down to Old Trafford and playing Manchester United. Mark, what's your memories of Celtic coming down to join you in that celebration? Well, it's a, it was a great for, night for me personally. We, I think we just uh, won the double. So we we're going to celebrate the respective of uh, the quality of the game on the on the night anyway. But uh, um, obviously uh, Celtic readily accepted my invitation for them to come down to be the opposition. And uh, we had a great night. Um, uh, the one thing I do remember is that actually uh, after the game, I was... I was sat in the bath as you did in those days and uh, just uh, cleaning myself down and all of a sudden uh, the police commissioner came in uh, with his cane and everything and I'm thinking goodness me what's going on here and he made a beeline for me and he said uh, uh, Mr Hughes can, I, can we have a word so goodness knows what I thought at the time so he, he said uh, we've got a little bit of a problem I said well what's happened and he says well the Celtic fans are all behind the goal and they're not going to go home unless you come out and wave to them. So I was soaking wet and, and, and naked and I had to dry myself off very quickly, go out and uh, put a Celtic shirt on and uh, stand and have a photo uh, before they would all go home. So uh, that was a great moment, a great memory. And uh, thankfully they did at some point. Oh, that, that's superb, Mark. And you know... When you're looking back at that Manchester United team, um, obviously managed by Sir Alex Ferguson, and Mark Bowen said before that uh, all the great coaches are thieves, what what do you think you took from the great Alex Ferguson um, when you went into management yourself? I think I didn't pick out one element. I'm sure I was fortunate to, to be managed by a lot of good managers, not least Sir Alex and... Uh, and invariably you will pick up things from them that uh, you're not really conscious of. But um, I think the, the key was that Sir Alex was always about making sure you give your best, making sure that uh, you didn't leave anything out there. Um, he would make you aware of who you rep were representing and the, the responsibility that that brings. Certainly when you were wearing the red shirt of Man United, then there, there was a... Uh, responsibility to, to perform at the right level and, and give everything. And um, yeah, you, you, you can never really put your finger on the one thing that I remember particularly, but uh, certainly it was his, his demand to, to have the best performance from you as an individual. I think that's, that's what stays with me. There's certainly probably other things that um, I can't 
be more specific about, but certainly that is one of the main things he demanded of his players. When I look back on your managerial career, Mark Hughes, 610 games, I think it is, correct me if I'm wrong, and all at the top level, international level or in the EPL. You've been away from the game for a couple of years, albeit one of those years has been blighted by COVID. Um, but are you now at a stage where you think, I could go back into that, I'm ready to go back into management? Yeah, I made um, a conscious decision after I'd left uh, Stoke and uh, Southampton in my last two positions, only because uh, I'd had almost five seasons at Stoke and had a lot of success there, enjoyed my time there. I didn't finish quite how we wanted it to, but uh, albeit uh, given uh, trials and tribulations since we left, um, maybe it was the right time for, for both parties. Uh, got the opportunity very quickly to go in at Southampton. I think we only had maybe five, six weeks of break um, and we were straight in again. So after leaving that position, I just felt I needed probably a good break, a break that I hadn't had for quite some time. So I was always going to take at least 12 to, to 18 months out um, and then look to get back in. Obviously, COVID has, has read its devastating head and, uh, and it's affected me only in as much as my time to able to get back in and thankfully not health-wise or anybody close to me. So... Uh, um, so my timetable has been shifted a little bit, but uh, certainly uh, I've been ready to go back in for, for a long time now. I don't dismiss any opportunities um, um, at home or, or abroad. Um, I'm a professional football manager, so it's what I do. And uh, um, if the right opportunity is there, it doesn't matter where in the world it is, um, I will be interested. So uh, that's never changed. That's always been a constant throughout my managerial career. So, uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm looking to get back in. Uh, I don't know at this point where it's likely to be or, or where in the, in the world it will be. It's, it's changing times and difficult times, obviously. But um, as I said, um, I'm looking to get back in. It's, uh, it's what I do. It's what I'm comfortable with. Uh, and what I'm effective at. I'm looking forward to your turn to the game. Uh, Mark Bowen and Mark Hughes, it's been an absolute pleasure for the last 45 minutes or so chatting to you. Uh, I could chat to you for a lot longer. Unbelievable football careers. Thank you so much for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Thank you, Paul.